This is Jen Lewin. I'm so sorry that I can't be there this Friday. I am here in New York on a rainy day, and because I can't be there, I'm hoping that I can give you a brief tour of my studio and talk about some of my work from here. So I thought I would start this off by talking about several of my projects and going through the process um, that I've discovered and developed over time in creating my illuminated interactive artwork. To uh, begin, um, I have this slide of where I actually grew up. Um, I grew up in upcountry Kula on the island of Maui, and my childhood there was, uh, was honestly very magical. I had this amazing experience almost daily of being on the crater and watching the clouds come in at eye level and being able to see above the clouds, but also under the clouds, and having these really beautiful effects of natural light and gradations of color surrounding me in my daily experience. At the time, I was um, infatuated with art. I would paint. Um, I would create anything I could get my hands on. I was also a classically trained ballerina, um, but also really, really interested and enthusiastic about science. Um, in fact, I was constantly taking apart electronics. I was learning how to program on a uh, computer in the, in the 80s. In fact, in my next slide, um, I'll talk about one of the profound things I got um, to be part of was an experiment. Um, an experimental education, educational system uh, in the mid 80s, early 80s called LOGO. And it was designed by Hal Abelson out of MIT. And it taught kids to program on these very old computers. And I learned this language of, of LOGO. And in learning the language, I was able to move a, a small turtle around a screen. You can see a little bit of an example of that right here. Um, moving a turtle around a screen to essentially draw sort of early computer graphics. And for me, this was a transformative moment um, because I was so interested in art and science, but I really wanted to do both of them. So learning to program at this early age, for me, opened this door in my desire to sort of start to really explore different methods and mediums within art that could use technology. And I think you'll see a lot of uh, pieces of that throughout the course of this presentation. Later in life, I started to do um, a little bit of just you know what I described. I started to really mix these mediums. Um, this is a good example of that from my graduate work. This is a large, you're, what you're looking at is hand-painted silk that I painted in my kitchen. Um, you're looking at circuit boards up in the corner, a custom PCB circuit board that I made myself. There's actually woven LEDs throughout this sculpture, and this was made kind of the 90s. And what I created or experimented with in this art piece was creating a large robotic butterfly that you could actually dance with. And these wings would move away from you as you moved towards them. So you could have this ethereal experience with this large, um, you know, robotic creature that was also hand painted that also had this play of light and illuminance within it. And this piece was really me sort of um, experimenting with a mashup of science and code and physics and painting and art, but also sort of unconsciously, I think, playing with this idea of the relationship between art and the viewer. Because in this piece, I'm really bringing people into the piece. And you can see sort of, um, sort of early examples of, of, of hand building the wings. I'm actually working on a new, I'm really excited, I'm working on a new version of this work um, that will go live this November, an outdoor version. Very, very excited about that. Um, but these pieces really began to explore this idea of relationship. And I used light and luminous and like luminance qualities within that um, and very much on purpose so you know this isn't the butterfly the one I just showed you but these are moths and I call them the moths and the moths had these light elements that you would touch that would glow and as they would glow they would set the moth above you into flight and I'm very purposefully in this example bringing you into the sculpture um, I'm using light um, the metaphor of the moth itself, which is attracted to light, except in this case, I'm attracting the human <laughs> into the work. But I'm also creating an artwork that really only comes to life once the human, once the participant is part of it. So it's viewer as performer. It's using light 
to bring people in. It's creating engagement through light. Um, and we can watch, these are very low res uh, piece was from the early 2000s. So looking at kind of old video um, here, someone is touching this orb on the ground that I filled with lights, it senses capacitance, and then sort of wirelessly connecting to this moth up in the air to set the moth into flight. Just mentioned some of the technology around this. Part of my art making from the very beginning has also had a long, along the lines of it, a technology making piece because for me to really master this medium, I felt like I needed to understand the medium and be able to build within the medium. So as I'm telling the stories of these pieces, I'm also telling the stories not just of the art, the concept, and the learning along the art, but also the technology that I built. So this is an example where I actually started to start to refine the technology I was creating um, to create tools that I then later use and will sh will, those will show up in much of my work. An example of that is here. I mean, this is a wiring harness from a work from a long time, uh, time ago. Might look like kind of a nightmare of wiring. Um, you're looking at custom driver boards and custom LEDs um, and really quite a tangle. Um, here I am uh, with a welded aluminum form and I am actually like epoxying these partially incomplete glass bulbs into this frame to make this work. Um, which I, is one of my first, what I called Edison Clouds, and I have quite a few series of this work. And this um, also sort of set about this exploration in, in creating kind of more traditional light fixtures, but still having them be interactive. And this, what's happening with this cloud is you're seeing your shadow in it. Um, and as again, I've been making many different versions of these. Um, I have things called Edison Drops and these sort of interactive um, glass LED lights that allow you to play and be part of this beautiful kind of light fixture um, experience. Also started playing a lot with different kinds of materials. Um, this is a piece um, from about 15 years ago. And at the time, this product of LED tubes didn't exist. We've seen LED tubes like this quite a bit um, are around <laughs> recently. But at the time, that didn't exist. So what I actually did for this piece is I actually sourced some um, I found a place that had fluorescent tubes, old fluorescent tubes, and you're not supposed to just throw them away, you're supposed to get them recycled. So I found a recycling facility and I took these broken old fluorescent tubes and mounted them around LED strips. So these are actually reused old fluorescent tubes used as diffusers around LEDs to create this optical effect. So a little bit of a hint of sort of my interest as well in really thinking about materiality and thinking about the sustainability of materiality, which you'll start to see more and more in some of the future work that I've um, been part of. Early on in my career, also had some profound experiences working with other artists. I, I didn't get a chance to work with a lighting artist specifically, but I got the chance to work with some really epic um, uh, public artist, uh, my most favorite was Klaus Oldenburg. Got to work with him on one of his last big pieces, this is the Paint Torch in Philadelphia. And he had never integrated light before. And through some mutual connections, met me, and the two of us got really excited about integrating light into this piece. And we had really huge um, goals initially. You're looking at the top of the uh, torch, and you can see just this like light blob of paint at the very top. But originally, we were going to light the whole torch. Um, and so and this took a couple years, and there was quite a bit of back, back and forth. But for me, it was really just profound to get the opportunity to work with him and to watch his process, to watch how uh, a piece of this scope you know, unfolds, to learn the, the details. You know, we're, Here we are looking at this, and you can see the, one of the problems it was evolving, which is the skateboard. Skateboard, uh, <laughs> you know, scratches all over the piece. So really kind of getting to be part of this, how this was maintained and how it was um, installed was profound for me. So one of the really important learning lessons and um, really rich experiences I got to have earlier on. Another little example of that. Also got to collaborate on this piece. This was much more of an integrated collaboration. This is a piece called The Water Trail and Tree in Vail, Colorado, collaborated with Lawrence Argent, artist Lawrence Argent. And this was a pretty complicated piece, really giant fiberglass LED sculpture. Um, took many, many weeks of building. Um, 
myself and one other person sort of hand putting all of this LED, these LED systems. The piece has been there for quite a long time and actually I had to go back and refurbish the piece. We just did that recently. Um, at kind of the 12 year mark went back and replaced all of the LEDs. Um, I have this video from Vail taken on a phone, not super high res, um, but you can sort of see sort of the refurbished version of this piece. Learning a lot about what it means to make these lighting systems and these integrated systems that have to live outdoors and outdoors in a place like Vail where it, you know, there's an enormous amount of sun exposure, there's an enormous amount of snow, really large sort of temperature gradations. So quite a, a quite a, a exciting experience in that. Um, I've also played with light in uh, much more direct ways. I've spent a lot of time building laser harps. I started building laser harps in the 90s. This is one of my more recent laser harps. Um, been making these for a long time um, and have actually at this point developed a lot of the sort of in-house software and hardware to create these laser harps. Um, another really beautiful picture of one of my laser harps. And you may say, well, what is a laser harp? And we'll listen a little bit to a laser harp from the 90s, um, and we can hear me uh, talk about it. By moving your hand through each of the 60 light beams, you mix different sounds. For example, each beam can trigger up to 12 different sounds based on how you're moving. Slow movements create rhythmic pulses and whispering echoes. Fast movements create sharp notes and more jagged sounds. And creating these sculptures, you know, really required kind of the refinement of the technology again. So creating an actual custom sensor to build the laser harps. Um, I then wanted the laser harps to work outdoors. I got the really exciting opportunity to make a series of laser harps for accessible playgrounds, so they needed to actually be playground capable. Um, and these laser harps are interesting from a, a lighting perspective because they're, I use, um, I use UV light, so you don't necessarily see them, but they are still light, essentially, that's interacting. And we can look a little bit, um, watch some of the playground harps. This is one of the original playground harps um, installed in Palo Alto for the Magical Bridge Foundation Park. Another sort of laser harp that's in uh, the center of Minneapolis, um, across from Target Field, kind of a really fun, playful, sound and light interact interactive experience um, that really engages and changes the experience on the public sidewalk. It's called Sidewalk Harp. And then moving on to kind of my OG work, and this is the work that I think really um, sort of set me on a different track in my life. And this is a piece that I conceptualized and conceived of in 2008. It's called The Pool. And what I wanted to create was a playground of light where you could splash light around. <laughs> um, and that evolved into this work, The Pool. There's been several different iterations of this over the many, many years. But I really, I think, in my own practice, learned the most about what it meant to create the work I was trying to make through this, this sculpture itself. Here you can see a picture of it indoors. This piece has traveled all over the world um, to hundreds of exhibitions, um, every continent, um, really sort of actively has uh, moved around. And my team and I have had this profound experience of getting to move around the world with it and to see how engaging light can be, how this idea of a communal gathering space filled with interactive light really grabs everyone and brings them together. And I think you can see that sort of really beautifully depicted in this, this moment. Um, kind of some more videos from that same actual exhibition and here you can see it's, a, it's an interactive sculpture there's no single computer each of these platforms um, developed by myself and my team is interactive independently and you can play on it it's waterproof and jump on it um, it's it's had all sorts of uh, really you know wild interactions <laughs> with it over the course of its travels Um, an image of it at Burning Man. It's been back to Burning Man many, many times. It's kind of one of the OG pieces I've been taking to Burning Man. 
Different forms um, of it have existed. This is a, a larger version of it we called Cosmos that we actually had the opportunity of installing in Tokyo right before shelter in place um, started in New York City. And actually my team kind of installed it very quickly and we came back. Um, it was there for quite a while, but was it at least um, thankfully able to open and exhibit to the public for a period of time. But this is a large sort of version of that same work. And we can watch some other videos of it traveling around the world. I think one of the things that I mentioned is how touched my team and I were from that experience of traveling with it. And certainly there was another, you know, thread of learning that happened along creating a work like this. Um, one of them was how to ship a piece like this around the world. So becoming really good at logistics, being able to move things inter internationally, knowing what a carnet was, knowing how, what kinds of crates can fit on planes versus boats, you know, really all of the pieces that come along with then taking this piece around this world, around the world where it's traveling every two weeks to a different place. How do you have the right team to build? that can travel in that capacity. So another really big sort of, um, you know, learning opportunity in the studio to sort of support the global trans, you know, global moving of a sculpture like this. Also, how do you deal with it in the snow? Here it is in the snow, dealing with different climates, um, really engaging on different levels with different kinds of things we could do with the work. This is um, a series of educational courses that I taught in Hong Kong where we actually opened up the software. Um, we had come up with some really cool software that we used to tune these sculptures and I sort of helped and taught that to schools in the area and they were actually able to tune and adapt the work. So kind of another level of looking at not just the artwork itself and the playfulness of the artwork itself, but the actual technology around how we're driving these lights and creating this interactive, uh, interactive experience. Other fun things, this is a wireless brooch some friends made uh, for me that actually in real time would show um, on the brooch uh, if someone was playing on one of the pool sculptures nearby. I really loved that. And started to really think about the sculpture itself and how it installed. I, soon evolved another piece, sort of its big sister uh, called Aqueous, where the pool were these round kind of more singular platforms. Aqueous was a pathway that, uh, that engaged more in, a, in more of a pathway experience, also an illuminated pathway. Um, and you can see um, here is Aqueous when it went to Burning Man in uh, 2017. Um, really fun sculpture. Um, from the perspective that each time we install Aqueous, it's a different layout, and each layout is really interesting and different and has these different interactions. Um, one of the uh, little sort of hidden bits about this particular video is that this video was shot during the first time I actually ever saw the sculpture all laid out. It was too big to lay out in my studio, and so we could only piecemeal and test parts of it, and so this video is shot with the, as really liter quite literally the first time that saw the whole piece together. Um, which was kind of an exciting moment. One of my most favorite things that happens with my work, and, the, and this does, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's the most exciting thing is that often my, or not on occasion, my work can lead to the creation of other artwork. Um, during Shelter in Place, we did have this piece, Aqueous, that was at the Oklahoma Com Contemporary, and a dance troupe choreographed an entire modern dance uh, piece, as well as all this custom poetry about the work, and produced this film. And, you know, this was at a time when we were kind of all indoors, and they did this outside, and it was really, um, it was really inspiring for me to no see. Choice, but to reflect you as I walk amongst your curves and your grid lines, let us expand. The work also, these ground, you'll, you know, you'll recognize these ground-based pieces. There's uh, permanent versions that use very different material. I'm very thoughtful about material. Here we are with a permanent version of an interactive light piece uh, created out of structural glass. Um, this is an example of a, 
of a piece. It was sort of created to create playfulness and light within a, in a, a you know, normal kind of walkway area. It's called Promenade, um, interactive glass panels within the ground. Another one of my really favorite pieces, this is in Coral Springs. Um, I love this piece. It's quite, it's smaller than a lot of the work I've done, but it just has this very sweet sweetness for me. Um, it's called Ascent. Um, and a great video of uh, one of my friends actually testing out the interaction. The sound pieces have continued. Um, I keep exploring more and more of these laser harps. They've sort of merged. This is a sound and light harp in, uh, in Honolulu called Flow. And all the sounds you're listening to, by the way, are being played directly by the kids. And um, we didn't add a soundtrack to this. Um, so a really fun piece. I have a couple others within this theme. This is a, um, a big light sort of sculpture that's in Doral, Florida. The idea was to create a beacon of light, but also have it be interactive. It's called Helix. And other versions that sort of bring in and attempt to bring this playfulness into kind of different plaza environments. Here's a, you know, kind of more traditional large light chandelier, but also one that's interactive. You can like bounce light around and play with it. One of my most favorite pieces, um, and I think one of the most complicated pieces I've ever produced was a piece for the Minneapolis airport. It's called the Aurora. It's a giant glass interactive sculpture uh, in the middle of the Minneapolis St. Paul airport. Um, and this is a prototype of me building it. I'm building the software in my studio. And um, at the time, there you know, now there are actually some software tools that would have made this much easier, but we actually built all the software in-house. And I'm basically doing kind of uh, video tracking of myself, and you can see these like effects that are being created um, up and through this um, temporary tested mesh that's sitting in my studio. And I took this piece, I was also really infatuated, I have been for a long time, with traditional glass bulbs. And I take, I, I do a lot of work where I take partially incomplete glass bulbs that don't have a filament in them, and I actually add LED fixtures to them so that they have this modern LED lighting element, but they still have the really interesting organic, imperfect quality that I find in kind of the older actual glass, blown glass bulbs. So this piece has, um, has thousands of those bulbs, and the final result is called the Aurora, and it's an interactive sculpture, and all the lighting and movement through it is based on people below, and it sits over a series of interactive glass, dichroic glass lakes, um, and here you can see um, this young person running around, and the, like, the lakes are illuminating. Some other photos of me interacting with it. And this was kind of a wild, you know, sculpture to build. Um, lots of time in the airport. Um, one of the things that was fun about this work, though, is that every element of it, from every plug to the, every line of code to every LED fixture to these particular caps that attach to our glass bulbs to the rings, everything was done in-house and thought through and prototyped and played with. There was nothing that was off the shelf for this. So just this really um, fun, really robust engineering experience to produce this work and to really bring everything together. I think we have a kind of a fun video of it right here. We talk about the hardware, I, I know I've mentioned the hardware um, a lot, but I mean, this is sort of the new hardware board that we have developed, that we're working with. Um, in creating this, like, it's very hands-on. I had, I, I make spreadsheets like this, which actually, you know, identify all of the different components that I need to source. And during some of the sort of um, shutdowns that we had, this was really challenging, by the way. It was really hard to source all these capacitors and to find the MOSFETs and the diodes. But I think it's interesting to sort of reflect that part of 
of my art process includes a spreadsheet like this, which is to, to find these components so I can put them on this PCB board so that then I can make the piece of art that I want to make from it. And for me, it's really important to be integrated in the process all the way down to that level to understanding even where the, the, this smaller component is coming from that's going to enable me to make the artwork. Um, I mentioned kind of earlier on this sort of transition to um, looking at materials and material choices and one of the things that happened to me um, actually led by my husband was this sort of really rethinking of single-use plastic several years ago and really thinking about plastic waste in particular plastic waste that goes in the oceans and then thinking about my own art process when it comes to these kinds of materials so I made a commitment several years ago to really change the way I operated and the first thing I did in that was create a new work um, called The Last Ocean. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. And this is a work that was created entirely out of reclaimed ocean plastic trash that we actually found, helped grind down, and helped build. And here's a picture, for example, of one of the initial experiments and the processes to create these panels. Um, we're looking at plastic particulate that's all been collected and cleaned. Um, clear water bottles, yogurt containers, the blue is coming typically from like caps of soda bottles. Um, also looking at different fiberglass products, this is this really cool product called, by, uh, called Earthkind Resin, which is like a really interesting fiberglass using recycled fiber, plus also resins that can be recycled or are created from recycled plastic. And I brought this all together um, two years ago into a really large work called The Last Ocean. And this is a piece that's actually won some really wonderful awards. This is it in Vivid Sydney last summer. Um, and each installation in The Last Ocean, actually, I change it. Each installation is different. In this case, you're looking at uh, Antarctica, but with several of the large glacial forms calved off. And this piece was really wonderful to create. And we'll watch some videos of it. Um, here I am walking on it. I think one of the things about this that was so exciting is not just the creation of the material, but in the end you, or we were able to create this really beautiful, playful, light interactive experience that had this wonderful storytelling behind it and then all of this richness and education uh, potential around both the sourcing and reuse of plastic, but also these glacial forms in Antarctica. Skip, skip ahead a little bit in the video. In making this work, um, in making this work, I had this profound experience, however, which led to a whole new body of work. Um, I, I actually found that I was very depressed um, and very saddened by some of the, especially some of the research we were doing around these glacial forms. And out of that evolved this idea for this beacon of hope. And the beacon uh, is, this, is a bear. She's actually behind me as well. And her name is Ursa Minor. And she was uh, to be a bear from the stars. But for me, she was really this attempt to create something hopeful that kept me on the same path and kept me moving forward on this mission, but also gave me this sense that there was this, this sense of hope. She is looking up. She's looking up at the North Star. She's looking up towards the future. Um, and she sort of really took on her own life. Here she is at Bernie Man, um, and has since traveled all over the world. We can see her, um, here she is at Bernie Man. We see her here, she's um, in Canada actually traveling. And of course, if you're going to make Ursa Minor, um, you also need to make Ursa Major. So we recently just completed these are renderings of, this is our Ursa Minor who's behind me. Um, and we recently just completed Ursa Major. Uh, Ursa Major is made also of reclaimed ocean plastic trash. Inside she has this really beautiful womb of uh, infinity mirrored panels that each have and represent a different animal that's gone extinct in the last uh, well, in the last two years. So there's this really amazing womb um, of these animals that's sort of playing, you know, paying tribute, but also really recognizing their loss.
And of course, in making work like this, it's not just about making the, um, the three-story tall bear, um, but there was a lot, again, going back to logistics, like what does it mean to make a work like this? It included, for example, an entire custom trailer design um, that she moves around on so that we can move her around the country and we can actually get her to places and we can put her on exhibit. I'm gonna end with just some, you know, some new recent work. Um, this is a really fun big light piece we have in um, Arlington, Texas. Uh, it was commissioned by the Rotary for their 100 year anniversary. And it's a gear, but at night it's a large illuminated sculpture. We're also working on a new piece called Phronesis. This will go into Cincinnati in front of the Cincinnati Public Library. Um, it's a series of really tall towers, and each depict in binary striping on the outside one of eight different concepts rooted in ancient Greek philosophy. So a really interesting merging of ancient ideas, philosophy, um, but also binary, which is the language of computing. And you can see some of that translation. Um, and you know some other really fun pieces. I think it's going to be an exciting year. We've got some really, um, we're using some uh, old, old, old plastic from a piece that I've been had in storage for 20 years to create these interactive mushroom shaped drums. There'll be drum kits that you can play on. Um, this will be going into Florida. And we also are working on a whole bunch of new animals kind of inspired by the bear behind me. Um, I'm gonna close up with one of my favorite pictures. However, it's one of my, um, I feel like this really brings together a lot of what I'm trying to do. These are two vintage uh, stars uh, <laughs> um, from a fast food chain in America that I found. I found them in a junkyard and I retrofitted them and filled them with light and created this for a museum and they went up in a museum exhibition, a very formal museum exhibition. But in my desire to make this work, what I really wanted to happen is what did happen, which was this, um, which was this inv invitation for these two people to be part of the sculpture. It wasn't just about creating a beautiful light object or a silly light object and putting it on the wall. It was really about creating something that engaged people to come together. They're playfully behind them, they're manipulating them, and they're reaching out and touching each other. So in this moment, this art is really doing what I hope is the heart and soul of my work, which is to create connection, to create illumination, and to bring us together. Thank you. <laughs>